Thank you so much. Um, introduction. Uh, so next, now I'll be uh, introducing our speaker for today. So, so now uh, we introduce our presenter. Sorry. So we have started the tradition that in, uh, in honor of the La Conference coming in coming up in March, we dedicate the webinar in February to the best paper award winner of the previous La Conference. Therefore, we are happy that uh, Lex Yang Yan, who was asked us to call him Jimmy, who won the award last year with his team, uh, joins us today. Jimmy is a final year PhD candidate at the Center of Learning Analytics at Monash University. His research is about classroom orchestration and collaborative learning, and he focuses on how multimodal learning analytics can play a role in enhancing these processes. Today, Jimmy will talk us about his research that he presented last year and how that has evolved since that time. He will present two cases to illustrate his work on multimodal learning analytics, and I'm very excited for this talk. So thank you for being here, Jimmy, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rogers. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Jimmy, and I'm, I'm from Monash. I'm in my final year of my PhD. And in today's presentation, I will present you our work on um, social spatial learning analytics for embodied collaborative learning. In today's agenda, I will first give an overview of the related backgrounds and then introduce you to the conceptual framework of social spatial analytics. I will also present two illustrative case studies to show you how this framework would actually work in educational research and practice. Finally, I will close with a discussion of the potential opportunities and challenges. I hope you will enjoy this journey. So to begin with, what is embodied collaborative learning? Well, it provides a unique opportunity for students to practice key procedure and collaboration skills in co-located physical learning space, where they need to interact with others and utilize physical and digital resource to achieve a shared goal. Here are some examples, a team of nursing students working on some clinical task in a physically simulated classroom where they have to move around the space and utilize different medical device. It can also be students working on some collaborative tasks in the school library where they have to actively move around and discover knowledge in physical books or simply children playing puzzles or Legos together. As you can imagine in these scenarios, students' social and spatial traces could contain valuable insights regarding who and how they have collaborated with each others. However, it is often challenging to capture these behavioral traces, especially with traditional data collection methods, such as survey, interviews, and direct observations. These methods have three major shortcomings. They are intrusive, labor intensive, and susceptible to bias, which makes them impractical to implement for the ongoing capture of social spatial traces in authentic educational settings. So how can we do it? Well, the increased adoption of sensing technologies in educational research has demonstrated the promising future of scalable, automated computing systems that can overcome the shortcomings of the traditional data collection methods. This area of multimodal learning analytics utilizes physical and physiological traces captured from sensing technologies to generate evidence-based insights about learning and teaching, of which um, the growing maturity and affordability of indoor positioning tracking technology have made it possible and convenient to capture social spatial traces in the physical learning space with minimal interference and reliance on individual's perception and memory. There has been a growing body of such studies focusing on unpacking the social and spatial aspect of embodied collaborative learning. And now is the time to develop a conceptual framework that integrate and describe the state of the art methods that have been used to generate social spatial analytics. We derived the framework based on our prior studies, as well as a systematic literature review of the existing works. 
This framework consists of five primary phases. From the bedrocks of three essential foundations to different feature engineering techniques, analytic approaches, learning analytics, and educational insights. The framework also closed the learning analytics loop by providing the opportunity to update existing theory or derive novel learning theories based on the output findings. Let's dive deeper into each component of the framework. First of all, host theory on proxemics is the predominant and foundational theory used in the majority of the review studies. This theory describes how the interpersonal distance or proximity that individuals would maintain with each other in social encounters can actually reflect on the nature of their relationships. Decades of studies in social psychology have supported the use of physical proximity as one of the best predictor of social relationships and estimator of social interactions. This, this theory also laid the groundwork for incorporating other theories, such as the theory of spatial pedagogy and the theory of distributed cognition. Another important foundation is the learning design. Several prior studies have illustrated that the validity and utility of social spatial analytics are subject to the changes in learning design. These studies have demonstrated promising results in generating meaningful educational insights in learning design that satisfy two essential conditions. First, educational construct and interest should be strongly associated with students' or teachers' collaborative behaviors or interactions with educational resources. And second, these behaviors can be inferred from their spatial movements in the learning space. In other words, social spatial analytics could become ineffective and inappropriate in activities that contain little meaningful spatial information by design. The inputs from educational stakeholders are also essential for infusing space with meaning. Their input would inform on whether the educational construct of interest can actually be captured from spatial traces as well as the possible meaning behind different spatial behavior across space and time. As you can see, even the space around a patient bed in clinical simulation can be further divided into different meaningful space based on teacher's input. These three foundations would inform on the feature engineering process of how to extract different features and what can be extracted from social spatial traces. Let's begin with the sensing technology that have been used to capture social spatial traces. Wearable positioning tracking and computer vision-based system are the two predominant, predominant approaches for capturing social spatial traces in embodied collaborative learning. Wearable tracking system often involves the physical installation of sensors around the physical space, whereas computer vision-based system utilize a video recording camera and applies object tracking algorithm to identify individuals and their movement patterns. Both these systems output raw data related to time, space, and objects. Wearable tracking system can achieve a high level of precision, such as 20 to 30 centimeter error margins and less than 200 meter second latency. Computer vision system, on the other hand, um, is less accurate in terms of estimating interpersonal distance. Metrics such as screen distance or, uh, or artificially mapped coordinate system have been used in prior studies. These data can be further processed into three different types of features. First, the proximity between individuals and obje objects. The common distance threshold that has been used to identify an instant of social interactions is when the Euclidean distance between two individuals are within 1 to 1.5 meters. On top of that, using a time threshold, such as registering uh, interaction only if it lasted for more than 10 consecutive seconds, could pot potentially reduce the likelihood of misidentifying unintended co-location as meaningful interaction. For example, when teachers are walking around and supervising students, but not necessarily interacting with them. 
To further improve the confidence of pro proximity-based estimation, we can include body orientation data. This is a more advanced artifact, only currently available with um, ultra-wide band system. It can be particularly useful in small or overcrowded learning space, and when multiple physical objects are closely located to each other. For example, if a teacher is standing in front of the whiteboard, body orientation data would tell us whether she or he is facing the whiteboard or the student. This ability to differentiate body orientation could contain insights regarding their instructional behaviors. St students who are facing each other in close proximity are also logically more likely to interact than sitting back to back. Behavioral feature can also be extracted from students' and teachers' interaction with the different resources or parts of the learning space. We could use the insights from learning design and stakeholders' input to segment learning space into different spaces of interest and extract behavioral features based on the meaning of this space. For example, this figure illustrates how we separated a clinical classroom into different ta uh, task space based on the learning objectives. The teachers also helped us in determining the reasonable effective radius of each space of interest. After extracting these features from the raw data, we can further analyze the data using different analytic approaches. Unsupervised machine learning methods, such as clustering, can be used to categorize learning and teaching strategies. For example, we cluster students based on their social participation level and identify students who are becoming less socially active in the classroom. Supervised machine learning methods can also be applied to develop predictive models of students' academic and collaboration performance. Social network analysis provide, provided the tool for unpacking and understanding the social aspects of embodied collaborative learning. Within this network, a node represents a student, a teacher, or a space of interest that can be connected to other individuals and Edge is drawn to connect two nodes if any interaction were detected based on their physical proximity. The weight of the edges would depend on the frequency or duration of interaction between two nodes. We can extract a range of network metrics from social networks, including the number of dyadic and triadic interactions, group cohesion, and homophilic interactions which is the tendency of individuals to interact with others who share similar characteristics. These network features can be used to understand the changes in social dynamics between different groups and within the same group over time. Epistemic network analysis, or ENA, is a type of sequential analysis that combines the tools of network analysis which can be used to analyze the connection among the coded behavior features. This analysis requires data that have both temporally and sequentially meaningful to model the co-occurrence of different features over time. Social spatial data satisfy this requirement as the temporal and sequential patterns of students and teachers' spatial traces can be indicative of their learning and teaching strategies. For example, after applying epistemic network analysis, we can differentiate students' homophilic interactions based on their academic performance. Finally, statistical analysis can be conducted to investigate the correlation between different behavior features and educational constructs. We can also conduct statistical analysis with both metrics extracted from social and epistemic network analysis to compare the differences across multiple sample groups. For such analysis, we have two recommendations. First is to adjust for multiple comparisons when conducting more than two or, two or more analysis. And second is using non-parametric test over parametric test, unless the data satisfy the underlying assumptions, which in most case does it with social spatial data. Using these analytics approaches, we can generate four different types of learning analytics. 
Descriptive anal uh, analytics that capture students and teachers' social spatial behaviors can be generated through data aggregation, summative statistics, and data visualization. Although these analytics only provide insights about past behaviors, they contain significant educational value and can be integrated into supportive technologies to aid reflective practice by making salient aspects of complex educational construct visible for both teacher and students. These analytics are often presented in the form of timelines, heat maps, and networks to illustrate the trends and patterns of learning and teaching behavior. For, for example, as you can see, we have shown students their social spatial behaviors related to different tasks, as well as how they compare to the average of previous high-performing teams. Diag diagnostic analytics that explore the relationship between low-level social spatial features and high-level educational construct can be generated through statistical comparison and correlation analysis. These analytics are often used in exploratory studies to identify meaningful indicators of educational construct based on theoretical assumptions. The resulting funding can be used to gain a better understanding of the relationship between social spatial behaviors and educational constructs. Moving on. Predictive analytics generated through either supervised or unsupervised machine learning model have the potential to power early detec detection technologies, which teachers can use to identify and support both socially and academically at risk students. For example, students that may be subject to social isolation or experience friendship issues can be detected by clustering their proximity to other students and their social interaction patterns. However, we do not recommend adopting a generalized predictive model. Instead, predictive analytics should ideally be informed by the learning design, as the meaning behind the same spatial behavior could differ significantly in various learning designs. Finally, prescriptive analytics aims to provide actionable educational recommendations about learning and teaching. We are almost there. As you can see, these social spatial analytics automatically generated in the form of heat maps has been shown to students and help teachers to guide actual debrief. For example, teachers have used these visualizations to go over the different role each student played during the simulation and comforting emotional and stressful students. It is important for these analytics being developed based on stakeholders' input, as well as being evaluated by stakeholders regarding their potential benefits. This resonates with human-centered learning analytics and could even lower the barriers to adoption. For example, the process of co-designing social, social spatial features with teachers actually enhanced their understanding and ability to comprehend the analytics and the visualizations. These analytics could contribute meaningful insights regarding three different types of educational practice. Classroom orchestra orchestration is a complex educational, ed educational process where teachers design, manage, and adapt their pedagogy to the complexity and variability of classroom. Using social spatial analytics to investigate and support classroom orchestration is one of the predominant research directions. For example, social spatial analytics can inform teachers about their attention distribution among multiple student groups or across individual students, helping teachers to allocate their time better and ensure every student are attended. Another category of educational insight that can be generated from social spatial analytics involves students' social and team dynamics. These insights can be generated in both individual level and group level, depending on the learning context and stakeholders' preference. For example, individual level insights can inform on a particular student's interaction with other students and teachers, as well as their usage of physical space and learning resource. These individual level insights could provide the basis for developing educational technologies that, that offer personalized support to students regarding their classroom participation 
and social well-being, such such as helping teachers identify and support socially isolated individuals. Educational insights um, regarding student performance during collaborative content can also be made available through social spatial analytics. For example, understanding the association between gender homophily and students' academic performance, as well as identify the behavior action or strategies that high-performing teams have adopted compared to low-performing ones. Let's see the framework in action with two illustrative cases. In the first case, the framework was applied to support the research of teachers' spatial pedagogy in a large open learning space at a public primary school. This is a learning space over 400 square meters with no physical walls separating each space and movable furniture for students to reconfigure as, as they wish. A total of 98 students studies in this space, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., five days a week. Although in some subjects, such as uh, reading, students were assigned to different groups, they were still allowed to move around the space and interact with who they de desire, which is most likely their friend. One of the problems we are facing is how to capture and investigate students' spatial pedagogy and space utilization in such innovative learning space. Well, we used an indoor position tracking system to capture the location data of both students and teachers over eight school weeks, resulting in more than 77 million data points. We extracted seven um, social spatial metrics based on teachers' stopping behaviors, spatial distribution across the nine subspace, interaction with other teachers and students, and the time spent by themselves. Clustering analysis was then performed to generate descriptive analytics that characterize students' spatial movements. As you can see, these identified clusters are similar to the theory of spatial pedagogy, which proposed uh, four types of space including interactional, supervisory, authoritative, and personal. But instead of personal space, we identify a novel category of spatial pedagogy in this open learning space, collaborative space, where teachers spend significantly more time working with other teachers. We also found it difficult to differentiate between the authoritative and personal space as the identification of these two spaces are based on the location of teacher's desk, which is also movable in open plan learning space. So based on our findings, spatial pedagogy is actually context specific. When adapting the theory to open learning space with multiple teachers, the space would become interactional, supervisory, authoritative, or personal, and collaborative. This is an illustration of how the outputs of the framework can update existing educational theory and completing the learning, anal learning analytic loop. Here is a peek of the framework in action. I only cover um, spatial pedagogy, but there are more things we have done based on the framework, such as identify at-risk students and monitoring students' social participation level. In the second case, learning analytics tool was developed to support formative assessment in team-based clinical simulation. The simulation took place in an immersive clinical classroom with high-fidelity patient mannequins that have measurable and adjustable vital signs. Assessing team performance in such learning environment would demand teachers to reliably evaluate the team dynamics and prioritization of various clinical procedures. Likewise, providing students with um, feedback during the reflected debrief also requires teachers to collect and record evidence through direct observation while evaluating students' activity. As you can imagine, fulfilling this responsibility is extremely challenging, especially for teachers without extensive prior experience. So we developed tools to support the formative assessment and reflective practice using social spatial analytics. Based on the learning design and teacher's input, 
the space around different op, uh, different learning objects have been separated into either primary or secondary task based. Each team's prioritization of primary or secondary tasks can be automatically identified from positioning traits by measure the duration the members spend near different patient beds and medical device. The degree of collaboration can be reflected by the amount of co-location between team members. Teachers also provide the potential meaning of students spending time outside of any predefined task space. For example, co-location outside of task space could mean that students were actively discussing and distributing task responsibilities. Task transition behaviors can be defined as students located outside of the task space by themselves. A total of six special behavior features were engineered, engineered based on teacher's input and the theoretical foundation of proxemics. Based on these features, we conduct epistemic network analysis and found that for both task and collaboration performance, high perform performing team are characterized by their focus on working collaboratively on the primary task and engage in task discussion. Whereas low performing team are characterized by their focus on the secondary tasks, either individually or collaboratively. The teacher consider these uh, educational insights valid and interpretable during a post-call interview. They also envision the utility of these analytics in practice. For example, they demonstrated a profound interest in using the epistemic network as visual evidence to encourage and guide students' reflections during the debrief. And surprisingly, they also demonstrated a high level of understanding and confidence in using the epistemic network as a supportive debrief tool, a potential benefit of involving teacher during the foundation stage. Again, I only covered a portion of this framework and there are more practical utilities of social spatial analytics. For the remaining time of my presentation, I will present some opportunities and challenge around social spatial analytics. Prior observation studies were mostly based on small samples and often lack reliability evaluations, which could make the findings vulnerable to the replication crisis and diminish their scientific validity. So one of the opportunities of social spatial analytics is providing a potentially more reliable and less biased methods to reinvestigate previously found relationships between social spatial behavior and educational construct, such as the impacts of inst instructional proxemics on teaching and learning. Another opportunity is that the data collected through you uh, sensing technologies also exhibit a great temp greater temporal and spatial precision than direct observations. As I have shown, these granular position data have made it ha have made advanced data analytic techniques more viable, which would benefit research into contemporary educational theory, such as validating and updating the theory of spatial pedagogy. The ability of social spatial analytics to capture spatial information can also en enable new opportunities for assessing the effectiveness of specific learning space on teaching and learning behavior, which is an identified gap in learning space literature. In terms of opportunity for educational practice, as shown in the second illustrative case, there is a need for support supportive tools that provide timely and evidence-based reflection on students' learning behaviors. Social spatial analytics could contribute to the development of such technologies by integrating essential theoretical foundations and the human computer interaction concepts to ensure the validity, interpretability, and utility of the resulting insights. While the feature engineering and analytic approaches described in the framework could provide the, ba the basis for developing AI that automates both the collection and analysis of social spatial data, the involvement of stakeholders during the design and evaluation of the analytics could also enhance the transparency of any AI system developed based on social spatial analytics 
contributing to the call of ex exp explainable AI in education. However, for social spatial analytics to achieve its full potential, there are some methodological and practical challenges that need to be addressed, such as proximity-based identification is at most an estimation of whether an interaction has occurred, which depends on the level of familiarity between individuals. The reliability of such estimation could potentially decrease in a situation where most individuals are strangers, such as newly formed classes, resulting in false identification of non-reciprocal and unintended interaction from close proximity as meaningful encounters. Second, uh, although social spatial analytics has the potential to automate data collection and analysis, achieving a high level of auto automation without researchers' involvement still requires further development, as most of the existing innovation rely on us to determine and perform data analysis. Such dependency is not sustainable for a practical solution that aims to be used by teachers in authentic practice. Additionally, while the sensors and sensing tech, uh, the sensors could reduce the labor required for data collection, the initial installation and ongoing maintenance of these technologies would incur additional financial burdens. This expense may outweigh the benefits of using sensors in situations like small scale or non-repetitive educational act activities, where traditional data collection method might just be sufficient. So researchers and policymakers should consider the cost and benefit of inc incorporating sensing technology for both research and practical purpose. There are also um, some important ethics challenge, ethical challenge that need to be considered. The data-driven approach of social spatial analytics is subject to the potential privacy issue, such as unintended surveillance and data misuse, which are both vital issues concerned by students. We need to develop privacy and informed consent tools to empower state, uh, stakeholders with the right and access to control their own data. Privacy guidelines also need to be established around the usage of personal trace data such as these data should not be used to assess teachers' perform, uh, per professional performance at uh, any circumstances. There are also concerns regarding systematic bias and labeling students, which I'm more than happy to discuss after this presentation. To conclude, here are my two takeaways. First, social spatial analytics can be a valuable and useful tool for unpacking embodied collaborative learning. But remember that it is context dependent and might not work in learning activity with little or non-spatial movements. And second, grounding social spatial analytics in theoretical foundations, educational stake, uh, stakeholders' inputs and the learning design are essential for making sure the resulting insights are actually meaningful and useful to stakeholders. And here is a reference and a reading list for you to explore. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention and time. Uh, thank you, Jimmy, for this uh, very insightful presentation uh, into your work. Uh, a round of applause from uh, all of us. Thank you for taking the time to, uh, to prepare this. We already have several questions in the chat, and now I would like to open the floor for a discussion. So far, all questions are from Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth, would you like to ask uh, one or two questions? And have been thinking about how we're going to capture things which aren't in that digital space. Uh, I, think, I can't really hear you, Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah I think I you we also have a bit of difficulties with the microphone. I mean, we can hear you, it's not great audio. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, maybe I'll just type in that. Can you hear me now? I think my biggest question is around 
um, do you get the subjects to do low level tasks so they're used to the wearables before the official data is being collected? Okay, so uh, just to repeat the question. So have we test the sensors with some low level tasks before being used in the collaborative context? Uh, the answer is no, we haven't. <laughs> we just applied the sensors um, in the in the open learning context and collaborative task because um, we think it is more um, it is more reliable to actually use in the actual learning context instead of um, doing a lab testing because you know like people might behave or interact differently during a lab. And one thing with the sensing sensing technologies and any other technology that require data transmission is you need to test in the actual context because lab is a perfect environment without any interference. But one of the experience, one of the lessons we have learned is after we installed a super expensive system into a very highly teched space, the signal is getting interference by the signal from the television and from others. So we can't, we cannot get reliable um, signals. So I think um, testing in the actual learning space is would be better to test in a lab environment. Um, yeah, that, that's what I meant. I'm just thinking we went yeah. straight away and um, put it on them and start like they need to find the use of the fact they might be wearing something or the mm. thing that they filmed. Mm. So they pay this. If I knew that I was going to be filmed as a nurse carrying out the procedure, yeah. that would make me quite nervous. So what I mean is like if you did several dummy runs of practice runs to allow them to get used to the fact that they're being monitored or filmed. Um mm. yeah, it, because that might they might be changing their behavior knowing that they're being filmed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. After a while, like it fades to the back of your conscious, doesn't it? And you might forget you're being filmed. But it's that that yeah. only thing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I think um one thing we did is we, um, we actually used the filming, like the video recordings in the nursing simulation. So the it, the simulation is actually being filmed before our research. <laughs> so there will be other stu students sitting in the debrief room watching them doing all the stuff. And we just use that video or just use a different video to collect a better quality data. So these students are already being filmed before our research. So our research didn't any didn't put any burdens on them. And we also asked them about uh, like, are they comfortable with the sensors being placed on them? And I think we have a 6.7 out of seven uh, comfortability. So I think in that kind of context, they don't really care if you are putting sensors on them because it's kind of a highly stressful situation. But definitely in other contexts, I would re highly recommend you ask the student first. That's also, that's also the importance of co-designing with stakeholders. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth, for the question and Jimmy for the answer. Uh, I have noted another question from Elizabeth, but maybe we move on to Kathy and then we will return. Um, Kathy, would you like to ask your question or should we read it? Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, Jimmy, for a very, very interesting presentation. Um, I just wondered about the potential for students to opt out, whether this would be a realistic option for them, bearing in mind the, the sort of very unequal power relations in the sort of student-teacher relationship. Yeah, um, definitely opting out will be the option available, but informed concern would be the first thing we do. So during our data collect, any of our data collection, we'll get the student to concern to their data being collect. If they do not concern, we don't even put trackers on them. And after we collect the data, they can also contact us anytime to, for us to just delete their data forever. And for example, if in one simulation, one student asks to opt out, 
we have to delete the whole simulation because with the video, you cannot just delete one person out of the video. So we had to kind of delete the whole video. Yeah, so, um, but I think in this kind of context, opening out would be just trying to make sure the data is not available um, even to us or to anyone else. But I think there will be a more um, complicated opting out strategy we can kind of de develop. So student might want to opt out after they complete the unit, as you said, like they may feel pressure by the teachers, oh, I need to participate now. But if they want to opt out after they complete the unit, they can also do it with this click of a button. I mean, that's a dream, but that's something we are working on. That's great. Thank you very much. It's really um, interesting to see that you thought about all those things. And also, um, I was really impressed by the, the um, you know, in the very foundation stage, the inclusion of teachers. And um, yeah, I, th I thought that was really good to um, include educators in the design process. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um... We have a question from, I will mispronounce your name. I'm sorry. Tianru. Tianru. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, thanks, uh, Tianru here. Hi, Jimmy. Hi, uh, thanks for sharing. I really like uh, the way you organize all the different ways of learning analytics to answer your research question. I mean, the conceptual framework, I think it's very clear to put it in this way and very inspiring. So my question is um, because my research is basically the context of real world classroom. So I study collaborative learning, um, but usually students, they don't really move, you know, when they do either um, problem solving, engineering design or collaborative um, argumentation, whatever. So um, they, they sit together, but um, it seems that it's very far away from your research context, where research students context, where students a lot of chance to move around. Um, but I wonder, like, do you have any um, kind of suggestions or um, takeaways for um, real world classroom when students do collaborative learning, but they but they don't really move that much. And uh, do you think the social special, um, the social spatial um, definition, it also covers body movement during their collaborative learning? Yeah, that's my question. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. And um, I would like to still um, the brain of my colleagues, Ling Xuan, who is working with audio analytics and also with teamwork analytics. Um, so in this kind of simulation, it, uh, we put multiple sensors, um, students. So we have positioning, physiological, and audio. I think in the context you um, describe, so which is students just sitting next to tables, uh, just sitting in fixed settings and just discussing uh, collaborative tasks. I think that is the perfect situation for audio analysis. Um, there have been a lot, lot of research on that to model um, cognitions, um, socially uh, shared regulations in collaborative learning. Yeah, you can definitely look into that kind of work. And the benefits of having different technology is now you can actually get uh, automatic transcript for audio using OpenAI's Whisper engine. So you don't have to pay hundreds of bucks to get the human transcript uh, transcript audio. And we kind of did some initial examination and the quality is pretty similar to the thousand bucks one. So it's free, you can try that. And the other thing is with uh, the emergence of, I mean, ChatGPT, everyone knows that, large language models, you can do NLP, like natural language processing tasks automatically now. So you can probably extract some features related to their uh, cognitions, attention, emotions, based on the audio data. And that would, I mean, that is much easier <laughs> than uh, just going through the video, going through the audio. But 
again, you have to validate, right? You have to validate. Uh, as for the meaning of social spatial, whether it would involve body movement, I think definitely if we can capture their gesture, the posture during collaborative learning, that would also mean a lot regarding whether they would like to be close to that colleagues or close to their students or they are kind of moving away from that which could potentially signal some kind of you know uh, issues or conflict during the collaborative learning process i mean there's a bunch of because uh, my background is in psychology so there's a bunch of psychology studies describe that kind of behaviors thanks Jimmy. we thanks. we have a oh. follow-up yeah go ahead Clayton please uh sure um how's it going jimmy my name is clayton i'm a uh, second year at uh, vanderbilt university in the united states um my focus is working in, in similar environments with nlp specifically and you mentioned whisper um which we're looking into as a possible solution for um automated speech recognition uh we're currently for our own transcription using otter and we're looking at deep gram as well i was wondering if you had compared uh, whispers performance um, specifically for collaborative collaborative environments um, relative to the other paid versions and what your thoughts were um we kind of compare whisper to um the human transcript <laughs> which we pay a thousand bucks i think hundreds of thousand bucks for it so and they take uh, ages like more than weeks and i think whisper is doing a very good job especially with the large model uh, but considering your, I think you need to consider the computational power you have to do that either post hoc. I mean, post hoc doesn't matter, really matter. But if you want to do it in real time, for example, in our context, we need to provide the analytics or insights to teachers like five minutes after the simulation. So they can actually use in debrief. In this kind of context, we probably can't go with the large model. We'll probably have to go with the base model. But I mean, yeah, that's what we got. Uh, if we can generate good insights, then I think that's also, and teacher thing is useful. I think Whisper is doing a great job. Great, thanks. No worries. Great, thank you. I think I would like to move the discussion uh, towards my question of it. Uh, we already started touching on that a bit. Um, and it's about the, the uh, practical implications um, you met or the, the opportunities for educational practice because you mentioned in your second case uh, the feedback from teachers themselves and they mentioned that they use the epistemic network analysis to open discussions with, with the students. So I was wondering how do these discussions look like because you kind of need to be a bit familiar with the method to really understand the, the graphs Mm -hmm. uh, or at least the ones that you showed uh, in the presentation. So I want, was wondering if you use these graphs or if teachers use these graphs or you have a different way of visualizing these results to them. Yeah. So um, that was the funny during our interview with the teachers. That was uh, 2021. And in 2022, when we tried to, when, when we actually showed the visualization, the teachers said, nah, it's too complicated. <laughs> Yeah, so that's when we translate epistemic network into something much simpler. Uh, I think it was in one of the slides, which is the button here, this. Yeah, so it basically shows the similar thing, but in, mm -hmm. in a more user friendly <laughs> and in a more like non tech way. So, yes. And that is also an issue you need to consider. After you explain some technical graphs or analytics to teachers and they are involved in the design process, they at that moment they might think, oh, I get it. But like one week later, they're like, what is this? <laughs> I have no idea. Show me something easier. And that is also the importance of involving teachers in the process continuously. Great, thank you. And then we have one final question from Elizabeth that I noted from earlier about human filters. Yeah, I'm just saying that um, one of the things that I'm hoping not to do when we start using analytics is to 
make decisions and interventions without the context. Um, so if you're going to identify, you know, if you've identified all that achievement, it seems to be interacting with anyone, checking for the context before you go and approach that student and say, it looks like, you know, you're, you know, you're not performing well because this, that, and the other. I think it's about making sure you've got the context mm. for designing an intervention. So it's like using the quantitative, but also getting that qualitative data to triangulate and then decide on the most appropriate course of action. Do you intervene? Do you not? How do you intervene? What's appropriate? That sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think exactly. Yeah. And one of the insights we found during um, the actual impl implementation of our visualization system is that even the data shows students uh, doing something like this, you said probably wrong or not as expected. The teachers are actually using this kind of ev evidence to comforting students. So you didn't focus on this task, but hey, you are working on this, which is also a important task because it's a teamwork task. You need to distribute your responsibility. So it is very interesting to observe how teachers are actually using this kind of uh, visualization or analytics compared to like our original idea. We're like, okay, you guys didn't do that great on this, 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 but it's not like that. Teachers are actually using these to comforting students. Great. Um, we have ah, we have another question from uh, Kathy. Um, I think we can do it. Two more minutes. We have time for a, for a final question. Um, thank you. Hello. Um, I've, I've just put in the chat that I can't um, help thinking that these are, you know, sort of uh, potentially very invasive and surveillance technologies, and they have the potential to be misused, or at least to determine decisions that, that students, you know, have little redress, you know, either because they don't understand how they've been made, or the decision has been made by an opaque system, and you know, they can't really resist it. So how, how would you guard against those sorts of criticisms or scenarios? Um, that is, I think that is the question surrounding any technologies, <laughs> educational <laughs> technologies. And um, how we do it is first, consent, informed consent, actual informed consent, not just a piece of paper, actually explain everything to students and giving them the option to open out at any time is very essential, as well as using these kind of technology only currently only in a formative assessment context. So students' grade is not affected by any kind of decision or analytics provided by our tools. It's only used to support them to reflect on their learning activities. So, I mean, how can we pro prevent it being misused? Um, we can definitely control the data security. That is the short thing, but also educating teachers by involving them into the code design process educating them how they will use the data. Or sometimes you actually find the teachers are ed educating you how they will use the data. You might, as I just explained before, you might think one way, but the teachers said, no, we need to make sure students are feeling comfortable. So we're gonna actually use it in this way. So you need to actually iterate your process in the, uh, in, in the process, <laughs> iterate the process in the process and making sure like the stakeholders, not just students, teachers but maybe also like institutions are happy with like what you are working on hey thank you very much thank you all right thank you everyone for uh being active in the question round uh thank you very much jimmy for for all your answers and the time and effort you invested uh in preparing for this webinar uh, before we end, we're almost to the end. Before we end, uh, Rogers posted two links in the chat. One is to 
Um, one is a link to a, a short survey, one minute survey. You can provide feedback on the webinar and what we can improve in future, in future uh, episodes. Uh, and secondly, if you want to stay in hand with announcements from Solar, you can join our mailing list. We send um, a newsletter almost monthly. Um, we will, yeah, we are um, almost running out of time. So we will have to close the webinar session now. Um, again, very big thank you to Jimmy, our presenter today, and of course, Thank you again for everybody for joining us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the discussion and we hope that the session inspired you. We are planning another webinar in, uh, in two months. This will be in April. Uh, we will announce more details as I mentioned on the newsletter through the Solar newsletter and our social media. Feel free to subscribe to our newsletter and join us in, um, in the next episode. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you, I'll see you later.